Tim Flannery and I are on a great new adventure in China. The first leg took us to the seat of power, Beijing, and to the heart of our relationship. Here we are in Beijing and we're surrounded by mountains from the Pilbara. We dipped into more turbulent times. And so the tanks rolled by. Yes, very, very tense. Uncovered the cost of the Industrial Revolution. We're actually moving back to Australia actually because of that one day. And asked, is there more in it for us than just our resources? Essentially, to China, we're a hole in the ground. Next, it's Shanghai. Rich and poor, constructing the new China together. And what it all means for us. I'd like to buy an Australian rock lobster. Yes. yes. Odalia. Six. Two hundred dollars. Don't you hit it? Two hundred? No, no, it's not, is it? Now, to me. Let's fall in love. Tim and I are now heading to the coastal city of Shanghai on one of China's high-speed bullet trains. It's 1,300 kilometres away. We'll be there in just five hours. This train would do the Sydney-Melbourne trip in about three. Shanghai started off as just a simple fishing village, Tim. But the word Shanghai came into our language. To be shanghai meant to be taken and forced to work against your will on a boat. It gives you a sense of sort of lawlessness, doesn't it? A lawless port city, I guess. Well, during colonial times, of course, uh, every bugger was here trying to shovel out what he could. You had the Russians, the French, the British, the Dutch, you name it, they were all here. We're doing 302 kilometres an hour, Tim. Is that impressive? I would have thought a bullet train would be really like a bloody bullet. We'd be doing 600. <laughs> well, this is pretty limp, isn't it? Well, <laughs> 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 look, mate, compared with Sydney to Parramatta, yeah. it's bloody, it's going at the speed of light. We start at Shanghai's iconic Bund, with its financial district towering in the east, and the remnants of its colonial past to the west. Well, you can see why they call it the Bund, bunding off the river from the city, the old city. Mm. This is the, what, 1930s? Yeah, yeah. Part Art of Deco. town, Art Deco, yes. Shanghai sits on the banks of the Huangpu, the last significant tributary of the Yangtze, at more than 6,400 kilometres, the longest river in Asia. And every dawn, locals can be found here practising an ancient tradition. Tai Chi, Tim, there's nothing to it. You reckon? It's about a fluidity of movement. Right. Fluidity of movement, as you can see. There are certain techniques, all right? Now, one I've been studying at home is <laughs> to grab the bat, slowly. Oh, I see. Grab the bat. Yes. Down. And the cover drive. <laughs> I see, right. That's it. I never knew Tai Chi was so easy, It John. is, piece of piece. Hands by your side. We're going to do the dummy now, Tim. Right, Are the dummy, ready? yes. Grab the ball. Go to pass that way. Go to pass that way. But pass that way. OK, keep it fluid. And yes. Grab the ball. Grab the ball. And pass. And pass. This time... There's nothing to it. Listen to the shoulders. Listen to the shoulders. Be easy. Shake the hands. Shake the hands. Don't worry about any of this business. <laughs> Stay still. 
okay? You're a natural. Bit of rugby, bit of cricket. Easy. All in one morning. Shanghai's population is the same as all of Australia's, 24 million. Tim and I want to understand the impact of such sudden and intense urbanisation. But first, we need to delve into Shanghai's past. Former Melbourneian Shane Ullman is taking us to see the old parts of town. He loves Shanghai so much, he's parked his physics degree to become a tour guide here. Might be us, Shane, is it? Yeah, Shane? hey. G'day, John. Good. Tim. Hi, hey, Shane. Tim. Tim, how are nice you? Nice to meet you. Good to hey. meet you. Now, you're going to show us your Shanghai. Yeah, that's right, the old stuff. Fantastic. Yeah. It looks like an old BMW. It is. It looks a lot like that. It's a copy of a Russian copy of the old BMW. Oh, really? In 1945, when the Russians went in, they stole all the plans, and the Chinese army had been making these right up to 1997. Wow. wow. A bit yeah. of war booty that's done them well. We head off on the Guojiao, Shanghai's elevated highway, keenly aware of the inadequacy of our headgear. This is the way to see Shanghai, Tim. Tell you what, mate, when you're this low to the ground, it takes on an aspect of smell of armor, right? And tell you. Shanghai was once a British settlement, following the first opium war in the 1800s. Later, the French, Americans and other foreigners carved out areas of their own, known as concessions. Whoa! Hang on to me! No worries. We're on our way to the former American one. So this is how it all was one stage. Basically, from 1844, the Americans were given this concession up here. Yes. Yep. And you can see down in there, see those big alleys. It's really unique to Shanghai. Nice big um, yeah. archways. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a really, it's a really unique blend of the two different styles. Wow, you could be in Florence in a yeah. way. So, yeah. So they'll be knocked down and they're going to be replaced by stuff just like this, like you can see this yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shane, do people prefer living in the new high-rise or are they still attached to the old? Well, yeah, I was talking to someone the other day and they, they wanted to move out because they wanted the plumbing and the air conditioning ah. in the new place. Mm. But then also they lose their community. Yeah. Some of these people have been living here for four or five generations. Mm. So, sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. What is it? 20 years ago, yeah. everywhere was like this. Uh -huh. Everywhere in Shanghai. That's, it's been so quick, this change. Yeah. <laughs> the foreign concessions were dissolved in 1941 when the Japanese stormed in following Pearl Harbor. Chinese families later crammed into the original buildings that still stand today. This tiny little alley, and uh, we're going to have to be a little bit quiet when we walk down there because we're going to be about half a metre from everyone's home. Basically, you've got the houses on the left side, and then on the right, you'll have a bathroom or a kitchen. Basically, they'll share it between 10 families or so. They'll share one of these bathrooms. This is like walking through a living 
medieval landscape. It kind of got stuck in a time warp because uh, 1949, when the communists came to power, yeah. they didn't want any development to happen in Shanghai because Shanghai is a danger city. Like there was trade and business uh, here, uh, very uh, capitalist, right? Yes. Yeah. So they said, you know, no development. So that's why people ended up getting crammed into those places because they have kids, but they couldn't build any more houses. Ah. Uh. <laughs> so John, having seen this, it's pretty hard to be romantic about the old way of life. You can only be romantic about these places if you don't live in them. That's right. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to take you guys to modern Shanghai, to the, to the really new stuff. OK, right? fantastic. Yes. Today, the ramshackle building is crumbling in the face of urbanisation. And there's no better symbol of modern Shanghai than its tallest building, the World Financial Centre, known locally by its nickname. That, just over there, you'll see the bottle opener. Oh, yeah, 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 right. We're going to get the ferry over there just sure. to check it out. So you'll see on the top there, you've got that square hole. Yeah. And it's, a, it's an interesting story, actually. I was having dinner here with this Japanese lady. She was talking about how the original architect was, um, he wanted a big round hole on the top. Right. Right. But if you think about it, the round hole, um, and we're facing east, remember? Yeah, so yeah, when yeah. the sun rises, you get the sun coming through this big round hole. Japanese flag. That's the Japanese flag. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that would have got right up the nose. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think the Chinese would have liked that. Yeah. yeah so that's so, why that's why it's square. There's well, there's the old one Pu. We head across to the east side of the Huangpu River and over to Pudong. It's home to Shanghai Stock Exchange, which China hopes will be the global financial hub within a decade. Just 20 years ago, this was an agricultural district with not a single skyscraper in sight. Shane drops us off at the bottle opener. We've got an appointment to meet an Aussie architect on the observation deck. Fantastic, thank you, Shay. It's 101 floors and almost half a kilometre above us. Thank you. Hey, 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 Tim. You wouldn't want to have epilepsy, John. Why, hey, 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 hey. We're going up to the 95th, Tim, or it's the... 96th first, 96th down to the 95th. In about a minute. But a bit Doctor Who-ish, really. Like Doctor Who, when it opens, it'll be a whole new world. <laughs> uh, the lower car is now in service. The lower car is now in service. The lower car is now in service, yeah. I don't know what that means, but we're not to panic. Oh, well, they don't open the door at 96. No, not, no, oh, no. <laughs> this is us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. World-class architects have flocked to Shanghai to be part of its boom. Sydney boy Stephen White was one of the first Australians to set up here and wants to give us a bird's eye view of the vast city he's seen emerge. Thanks, mate. Welcome to Shanghai. Hi, Stephen. Good, good yeah. to meet you. Yeah, it's good to see you. Thank yeah. you. Well, what an impressive pile this is. Well, I'm glad you came up to the highest part of the city. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is pretty much it, eh? This is, uh, they've got the old bund over this side. You want okay. to have a look there? Yeah. first came here, it must have resembled a building site, I suppose, well, we've had it, some it, difficulties. It, it was mud. It's really just a lump of dirt and a few vestigial houses and some old industrial buildings and that was it. It was one story right across. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's been a huge change and it's been a privilege really to be here mm -hmm. and see all of this happen. How long would it take to build this building? If you added up all of the uh, the, the, the months, about yeah. four years. About four John? years. Yeah. And how long would it take to build a building like this in Australia? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, it would probably take, in terms of getting the planning approvals, about 10 years and then maybe about five years to, to do it down there. It's and I'd say that's not a bad uh, thing, John. So this is a little more can-do. Mm, it's a little bit more can-do. So, I mean, this is part of a rush to, to populate this piece of dirt here. 
Yes. And uh, this is happening because we're going to be the centre of the universe in terms of the finance uh, world for China. Yes. And uh, we need to have and space to, to occupy yeah. for all of the, uh, the new financial houses that are coming into town. Well, that's interesting. In Australia, we saw a time when Sydney would be the financial hub of the Asia Pacific. Right. What do you think? Do you think that ambition is still there? Uh, look, um, it's always good to be a bit further north. <laughs> Shall I say, John? Well, you know, the difference, John, is that yeah. Sydney isn't the centre of any population mass. This place here, where we're standing yeah. now, yes. is pretty much the centre of the largest mass of humanity that has ever existed in the whole history of the Earth. Tim, a uh, couple of beers on the Bund, first day in Shanghai. Yeah, exactly. Nice way to end the day. Perfect. But they don't have twist tops here. It's a good thing I bought a little souvenir. I don't know whether it's functional, but we can try. Try it, Tim. Oh. There we go. Cheers, old mate. Cheers, mate. Tim and I have glimpsed 200 years of Shanghai's history in just a day. But from what we've seen top down and in the old lanes, Shanghai appears to be two cities. One for the poor, another for the rich. Next morning, we're meeting Daniel Jang, who'll be taking us to his exclusive club. He's one local who's ridden the wave of Shanghai's boom as vice chairman of a construction company. China is brimming with billionaires, anywhere between 150 and 360, depending on whom you believe. But Daniel's Ferrari is climatologist Tim's worst nightmare. Ah, this is my ride, Tim. Oh, really? What's up, guys? Hello, Daniel. Hi. How are you? It's lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Can I see you? Yes, Hi, Daniel. Tim. Nice to see you. Good nice to meet you. you Tim. How are you guys Good. doing? Yeah, we're doing well. Good. Now, we're going to the Mint, which is in the Bund, which is Correct. What, about five kilometres away. Correct. And how far is that? Like 10 to 15 minutes drive. Beautiful day, beautiful weather. Fantastic. Nice roads. Yeah. Well, Tim reckons he can find an alternative means of getting there that's oh, faster yeah. than us. Yeah. yeah. All well and truly stitched up, mate. Don't worry, <laughs> I've got my means. All right, Tim, your yeah. time starts. Now. Right. Let's do it, Daniel. Let's do it, let's do it. The devil shits Ferraris, mate. Oh, wow. Okay. Hello, mate. Can I grab the keys to that bike? Okay. Ah, she, she. Thank you. Good. Top speed, 335 k's. Tim's electric scooter, 40. He might have the advantage in Shanghai's traffic, but Tim would choke to hear that almost one car for every Australian was sold in China last year. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of hard questions about this. I see a lot of Bentleys around. Yeah, Benny's good. I've got Benny. You've got a Bentley? I've got Benny flying spawn four door. Uh-huh. And how many Ferraris have you got? Ferraris? Yeah. Yeah, we've got, I've got a few. A few. How many you got? Ferraris got three or four. Four? It's, well, you don't know. Three, three or four <laughs> Ferraris on there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. how many litres per hundred kilometres? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I just, I just never, I think I never cared about this. Oh, okay. Uh, so you, you fill it up? It's two days. A tank will last you two days? Yeah, once two days. OK. Ah, yeah. oh, it's still all right, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well. Well. Very impressive, Tim. Oh, I don't know what held you up. Ah, well. Yes. Anyway, at least you Very made good. it. At least you made it. Yeah. So you've been here, you've been here. I did, yes. Really did I did. Uh, you were a little bit behind. 
Daniel is part owner of Mint, a hangout for Shanghai's elite. Daniel, the English playwright George Bernard Shaw said of the United States of America that it went from poverty to empire without passing through civilization. Right. Has China's rapid development been a good thing or a bad thing? Well, good and bad. Really. Yes, it's very good. You know, we've got 1.4 billion people. Everybody' lives getting better. Right? You know, you know, we're missing some stuff. You know, because we've developed too fast. Right? Maybe our system is not well enough yet. You know, um, a lot of basic education system, tax systems, probably needs to be fixed. Right? Is the gap between the very rich and the very poor is that gap widening or narrowing? I think. It's widening. Yeah. Part of the people become extremely rich, and part of people become extremely successful because uh, there is a lot of uh, opportunities, right? Yeah. The high class needs to understand there is a low classes and how to supporting and helping them, yeah. right? And they care about them and that. Yeah. And then the low class has to be understand how do they find a way, you know, to become the middle classes. Because look at the economy of any countries. The bigger middle classes people, the cities, the more the country are stable. Right. That's right yeah. I look at Beijing. We were in Beijing, right. and you know, sure, they have, you know, a lot of people had a lot of cars, right. but the air is very difficult to breathe. Right. Uh, it's kids have trouble outside. It's Correct. not good for them. Right. So that seems to me a, a really a Western mistake. That there must have been a better way to do it that、right. you you haven't done that. And in China, we'll definitely have a lot of mistakes because we're developing quite fast. Got a 5,000 years, over 5,000 years history. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, yeah. but we are a very young country, you know, in terms of the new world, right? Yeah. You know, for, for what it's worth, I might throw in an observation.、Okay. When I look at China, I see a country in the last hundred years that's gone from an imperial system to the Cultural Revolution、mm. to the rapid development today, and it's almost to me as if China's in danger of losing its soul, forgetting what. It really is to be Chinese. How do you think you get that essence of China back? I think I think we never lost it. It's still there. Yeah, we're still there. I think we never lost it. Yeah. And it's just we've been developing so fast. Yeah. Everything we're Chinese, we understand our history. We study our history.、Huh. Okay. We see the stories,、okay. how people been failing, how people been success on that, and that's one of the most successful things I think our system did, is to realize our history, and we can learn from the history, and then we're creating the new history. And if this new history means making money. Australia should be part of it, and I know just the thing. Now, Daniel, what do you think? Style. It's got style. It's got power. Endurance. This is called the. the it's called the Monaro. Monaro. The old Monaro. It looks like a Monaco. It's Monaro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a Monaro. Yeah. 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 Now you would look very stylish driving around Shanghai in one of those. Yeah. <laughs> now Tim yeah. and I could import them in here. <laughs> Right now, but we'd need you to drive one for a little while just to be seen in it. Now, how much would we have to pay you to drive this? Oh、uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. While some in China make it very, very rich, the bulk of its 1.4 billion people are still rural poor, and with the GDP expanding year on year. It's the promise of a better life that's lured millions to migrate to cities such as Shanghai. We're on our way to meet one of the city's new migrant construction workers, Mr. Wong. He's afraid he'll lose his job by speaking frankly to us, so we're meeting him on a street corner. Hello, John. Hello. Now, where do you live? 哦，我自己住在，肯定住在工地的宿舍里。Is your family with you？ 嗯，我老婆孩子都在我们的老家。我，我和我兄弟在这里做事。How long have you been working away from your family？ 我出来已经有十十二三年了。孤，肯定孤独是孤独的，肯定没有一家子在一起好。这是。众什么众所众人所知的，<笑>对吧 ？If it's not a rude question, how much do you get paid a week? 
，一个月大概四五千块钱吧。Two hundred dollars, two hundred and ten dollars a week. Okay, how much of that can you send home to your family? 这个寄回家，我们这个搞工地的一万花都是平常只能给你一两千块钱，只够我们花的，用不了多少。年年底，工地把我们的工资全部借给我们，很很少拖欠工资的。呃，就是全部借给我们，带到老家里，好了，就这样。Okay, I've seen that system before. I think.、Uh, have you? Where have you seen it? It reminds me of、uh, the Burra Mine in South Australia in the 1850s. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a way of keeping the workers here, making sure they stay. Making、yes. sure they stay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair wow. enough. Wow. Do you feel proud of building the new Shanghai? 感觉自豪。为祖国建设出点力，感觉自豪。It's not just Chinese immigrants building Shanghai. One Aussie is shaping a city with a hunger for all things Western. For Melbourne's Simon Oxenham, it's a dream job. Simon, that's an impressive <laughs> entry. John, g'day. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. G'day, oh, Tim. Good to meet you. You too. This is the biggest skateboard park in the world, and you designed it. Yep. It had to be the biggest, had to be the best, and most innovative. And and when we asked them about budget, they laughed. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, there was so, no, 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 money, no didn't matter. Just, we just had to fill thirteen and a half thousand square meters with the most innovative, oh, skatable、wow. objects on, that we could、oh, come up with. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, here we are on a Sunday. Why isn't this choking with kids? Yeah, the management is. A, there's a private management management contract here, and and they're ma making.、Uh, it's a commercial arrangement, so they're they're trying to make make a living off charging an entry to get、oh, into this facility. Okay. And I think they're charging ten ten quai, which is、uh, is a lot. And you know, we look. We've been. Talking to people in Shanghai, and there is a need, demand for this.、Yeah. But you'd have to put on a bus for them. You'd have to let them in free. You'd have to have a few skateboards they could borrow to, to do it. But surely that's not impossible. No, not not impossible at all, Tim. But running activation <coughs> programs here, like learn to skate clinics,、yeah. etc., which it and that's how it started out. But I, I believe that the the economics of it didn't stack up. Well, it's this very functional view that you see in some parts of China. If it doesn't make money,、yeah. you don't pursue it. But If you take that view to this point,、yes. you're doing kids a disservice. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, you are. So, I've got one last question, mate. I'm in my fifties, never been on a skateboard in my life. Where would you recommend I start? That well, one over there. I'd put in. That looks pretty easy. <laughs> put it yeah, in that well, one. That one. I've had my yeah, own. Yeah, that, that looks too. great, Tim. That looks pretty <laughs> easy. I see how we go. If I can stand on it, I might give it a go. Don't、yeah. bloody walk off. No, you'll be right. Here we go. 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 Yeah, it's fantastic. Get a whole new career here, Tim. We've worked up an appetite and take time out for lunch. We notice a hive of activity around us. The migrant workers, who make up around 40% of Shanghai's population, are clearly not just building the city; they play a role in keeping it clean. The Godly Restaurant, John.、Oh. Looks to me that cleanliness is next to godliness. This is about the cleanest street I've seen in China. These chaps down here. Yeah. Now they seem to be collecting paper. There's cardboard. There's metal, styrofoam, plastics. Oh, that's great. Well, that's recycling. It's recycling.、John. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to find out a bit more about it, actually. One person who might have the answer is a Wall Street Journal correspondent who blogs about scrap collecting migrant workers. Adam Minter is the great great grandson of a New York rag trader, and is promising a tour. You don't get in the guidebooks. Hello, Adam. Hey. Hi, Tim. Great to see you. Great to meet you. 
What you have here is kind of a classic migrant neighborhood. Yes. None of the people on this side of the street are going to be from Shanghai. I mean, if you look at this side of the street, you've got apartment buildings there. Yeah. These are these are middle class people who are throwing things away. Ah. So much demand for new stuff. And it's very, very efficient. People yeah. we see on the street right now, they don't have other employment options in a lot of cases. Ah. If you don't have another employment option, you're going to dig deep into that trash, to put yeah. it bluntly. So can people work their way up from this sort of like, a, a scavenging lifestyle? You bet. Some of the peddlers we see moving around here right now, mm. uh, some of the millionaires in this industry in China started out that way. Wow, uh, well, there's millionaires in the industry? Billionaires. Billionaires. And that's wow. the thing you think. That is incredible. Started at, at this, this level. level. Uh. There's a man uh, who I've become familiar with. He now runs the largest private copper business in China. Wow. He started out, as he told me, picking nails off the road from his bicycle. Wow. <laughs> so can we meet some of these people? Let's meet say? some. Let's meet that some and let's see brilliant. how they do it. Ni hao. Ni hao. Okay. This is, this is your standard Shanghai recycling family. Shanghai Ren? Anhui. An she is from Anhui, a very poor province, and okay. a lot of the recyclers in Shanghai are actually from Anhui. So how old is his, her little boy? So does he go to school? Her grandson can't go to the Shanghai schools mm -hmm. because his grandmother does not have a hukou, which is a, a residence permit to live in Shanghai, so he's un ineligible. Uh -huh. So he has to go to what's called the migrant school. Yes. But to go to a migrant school, you have to pay tuition that's expensive. And how, how much would she earn a week? She'll earn around 400 to 500 RMB per week. That's 80 to 100 Australian dollars. And you know what? Yeah. That's not bad. That's better than what a lot of people will make working in factories in South yes. China. Wow. So she's doing okay and she's her own boss. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's not bad. I, my, my grandfather grew up on the back of his great-grandfather's truck. My father rode on the back of his grandfather's truck. And that's, this is how people go into this industry and they yes. tend to grow these businesses. It's okay. a very standard story. Ai xi xi xia jian xia jian xie xie yeah thank you good xie xie good luck bye 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 while this migrant worker is trying to lift her grandchild out of poverty and the lucky few go from rags to riches without money you truly have very little status here. And for the younger generation, the first under the one child policy, status is the key to finding the right mate. Tim and I are on our way to a quintessentially Chinese event, the 10,000 people public matchmaking gathering. In simple terms, a trade fair for lonely hearts. You can see the thing is, girls have got the upper hand here, Tim. There are far more men than women. Yes. So women can be very picky. And they're doing well financially, many of them. Yeah. And princesses, you know, one child family. Yes. So what are they looking for in a bloke? Well, I'd say they're looking for a bloke who's earning more than they are for a start. Wealthy. Wealthy. They'd Wealthy. have to be driving a Jag or a Porsche or a Bentley or something that'd help. Yes. Um, have his own house or apartment all paid off or whatever. His own house, his own business. Yes. Has status. Be. Yes. Sensitive. <laughs> Brings flowers on the first date. Yeah, do you think that matters? Oh well I do. No, I think no, no, no. I think if you go with wealthy status, own house and car, that's, that's it. it. There's one thing I'd add. Mm -hmm. Hung like a moose. <laughs> Well, do you know, I'm a, I'm a biologist, John. I happen to know that moose aren't all that well hung. <laughs> it's an extraordinary building. Now, to me, let's fall in love. This could be it, mate. At this dating expo, boys who are tall and look loaded get all the attention, while those who aren't try their best to stand out. So this is your 
first chance to have a conversation, maybe for a couple of minutes. G'day, I'm John, you know, I do this, I do this, I do this, I'm really interested in you and your lovely, can we swap cards and maybe go to Will you marry me? (laughs) But what soon becomes strangely apparent to us is that parents appear to outnumber the young. They're here to matchmake their children, but are interested in just three things, height, age, and income. Whatever happened to love? Born in 1990, I'd say so. 1.65 metres in height. It's yes. short for me. Yeah, it could be a bloke though. Ah. Here's one, 168, 170. 170. Yeah. She's got two here. 70. Is it a now, son or daughter? Daughter. No, my daughter. Ah, your Hi. daughter. Your daughter. So she's taller, she's She's tall. uh, born in 1982. Yes. She's 170 centimetres tall. Yes. Canada. 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 Oh, oh Canada. living in Canada. Okay, living okay. in Canada. Well, we're from Australia. Yes. No good? No good. Oh, oh no, no. OK. Thank no, you no. anyway. Thank you, good. A whopping one third of China's population will be over 60 by 2050. But with no pensions or nursing homes, a comfortable old age depends entirely on the fortunes of their one child. Is this your... My son. Ah, your son. Now, who is George looking for? What sort of girl? Uh, because uh, George was born here. Yes, born he was born here, here. yeah. Uh, left Shanghai in 1990, correct? 1990, so he's been away for a long time, yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, the age is going up. To- Yes, he has 37 already. So 37, yeah. yeah. So you're upset that he's 37. He should be married by now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But he's handsome like you. He's got yeah. degrees. Yeah. He's got a big salary. Yeah. Well, George is married already. For three months, they will be a oh, boy. Say that's no. Oh, oh really? Uh, oh. They're a bit, a bit not trusting. Not, no. Uh, no. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, he's damaged goods. Oh, well, maybe. But I think he's a great catch. I really oh, do. He's a great catch. He's a fantastic oh, I'm I is. wish you good luck. I hope Thank that you find someone. Thank you. Thank Ooh. you. Good, good luck. luck. Thank Thank you. You. If we find a good one, don't forget to tell me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, thank you Take very care. much. Thank you. Good. Yeah, well, I don't know if uh, George knows what his dad's up to, Tim. I think George is having a ball. I do too. <laughs> Toronto, big salary, 37. He's just loving it. He's loving it. He's saying, you've got years to go. And Dad's saying, he's 37. Where's the <laughs> moment going to happen? While their parents are keeping traditions alive, it's clear the young are only interested in a more modern Western lifestyle. about every brand here I know. Yeah. I know Gap, I know Longines. There's much about Shanghai that seems no different from any global city. At times it's depressingly familiar until you stumble across something bizarrely different. Well, this sort of thing could work at home, Tim. This is something we could take back. I don't think so. Fitness. Mate, I think people are take to this. They'd love it. Yeah? Oh. Yeah, I do. Well, good luck. <laughs> I mean, you're an enthusiast, clearly. Oh, I love it. Yeah. The only worrying thing for me is no one's got a smile on their face. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that might be part of the discipline. Yeah, oh, true. But that's the only thing we've seen that sort of... Yeah. Slightly indigenous. Oh, yeah. Boot oh, scooting. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. The next morning, as night soil pots are carted out of the lanes, we're getting another glimpse of China's past. Broad beans, just like you see in Italy. Yeah. Sold just as a snack. Noodles, eggs. Turtles. Turtles. 
little turtles, tiny yeah, turtles. Yeah, tiny little red, red eared sliders. Where would yeah. they come from? They might be farmed at that, uh, that size, I suspect. And that's a pretty common species, pretty easy to keep. Oh, okay. But even here, there are signs of change driven by the young's hunger for the West. Where once you'd only find pork, you can now find the more expensive beef. And the young want only the best. We've come to see Clinton Jew, who supplies beef to Shanghai's high-end restaurants. And that presents big opportunities for Australia. Ah, you must be Clinton. Yes, ah. yes, nice Hello, you Clinton. Hi, good to, to meet you. Good to meet you. How are you? Ah. Good, good. Interested to be here. This is. We're looking at pork here. This is the pork. Yeah, Chinese like pork. Yeah. We love the pork. Yeah. You go through about half the world's pork production, I think, That's in China. <laughs> now, can China produce enough pork for its own consumption? Not yet. No. So always uh, very hard to catch the demand. Any from Australia? No. 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 That's right, it would be a high, high cost producer. Uh, I hear there's been a shift, Clinton, in Chinese tastes and people are eating more beef these days than um, they were yes, in the past. coming. Yeah. Because Chinese people believe the beef is much better nutrition than the pork. Okay. And it's much clean. Can we go and see the, For the sure, beef? Yeah. yeah. Clinton sources beef from 80 Aussie exporters. Now, I say this looks a little bit like a sort of Russian army uniform. <laughs> Original for army. Okay. <laughs> here we are. Wow, what have we got here? Australia beef. Australian beef, I like the sound of that tin. It's incredible. It's oh my like God. Just so much of it. Yes, yes. yes. So wow. here, the value is uh, five million Australian dollar. Wow. Okay. Wow. It's like a bank. Sure, frozen yeah. bank. This is a bank vault. Australian wagyu. This is the strip loin. Good cuts. Expensive. Tastes yep. good. Yep. Yes. Looking good. It looks fantastic. Doesn't it, Tim? Look at this. It does. That's Look perfect. the fat. Look the fat colour. Yeah. This is the profit. And the beautiful yeah. strip loin. It's great. I'll put that back because it's bloody cold on my yeah. hands. Yeah. It's very good. How much of this comes into China? So totally about a 400 to 500 ton per month. Wow. So we're going to be China's quarry and its yeah. abattoir, meat yeah, yeah. supplier. <laughs> now the issue is not getting enough product. Yeah, it's yeah. only the beginning. It's only the beginning, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Month on month, our beef exports to China are exploding. No one knows more about the changing tastes of Shanghai's nouveau riche and Australian opportunities than Sydney boy Hamish Pollitt. He's the executive chef for an upmarket restaurant group. Take a seat. Yes, right. we will. Hamish, it's been interesting having a look today at the way China's changed, particularly Good in terms timing. of... That's <laughs> lovely. Oh, uh, well, put. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hamish, it's been fascinating today, going to the beef store and just seeing what increasing role beef's playing in, in, in Chinese cuisine. I mean, it seems to me there's a really fundamental shift going on there. That's a massive shift, massive shift. And I mean, you see it on television. Yeah. They have the master chef shows, they okay. have the cooking shows, and they'll have chefs from yeah. the West. And so there's yeah. integration and, and yeah. like a training going on. The appetite that this growing uh, middle class has got for new products to them as well. I mean, having a pork and rice and mm. vegetable diet for so long, then all of a sudden there's beef in, in there, not just any beef, but, you know, very well grown uh, beef and people are trying that on such a large scale, yeah. it's, it, it's sort of um, endless to think where it, it, it could end up. Yeah. So am I right in assuming one of the attractions of Australian produce is that it's known to be safe? It's obvious there's been f food scandals and issues here, yeah. like, like many other places, but yeah. I think this um, emerging, emerging class, middle class, are looking to eat out and try finer things, it's big in their minds. Now, we actually put a fair amount of wine into here. Yeah. Uh, if they get the taste for it... Well, that's red. I think red's more red popular. Wine, yes. And is it true that it's not uncommon to add Coca-Cola to it? Yeah, just to, you know, enhance one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Blanche, when you see a bottle of Grange come out, sort of pour that and then whack a bit of Coke in there. Co and... Diet Coke these days, yeah. Oh, right. Live a bit healthier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Living over here, you know, I'm sort of... Part of their culture, I don't want to sort of force anything no. 
No. You know, there's no, no right or wrong. And I actually really enjoy watching the way yeah. people want to learn and discover a culture. I think it's great. Drinking <laughs> wine, there is a right and wrong. A wine, you savour, you look at the colour, you have a sniff, you swirl it around, you enjoy its nuance, its subtleties. You don't add coat to it. That's dead no, wrong. No, but there's something different. But like, you know, well, if you've got the money to add coke to like a Grange 2008, just exactly. all the merit to you. Yeah, you know, that's just right. No, Drive no, home in your no Ferrari. Right no, I know. That, that, you know, that's a very common attitude. If you've got the money, then do it. And I might be wrong on this, but I often look at it and think, you know, it's it's their turn. It's their turn to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As we saw with Beijing's terribly polluted air. There's a tragic environmental price to pay for China's rapid urbanisation. Anything to do with boats? The Huangpu is one victim in Shanghai, a river dying as the city grows. Huangpu, if you see a run, you get a nice waft of it out. <laughs> All right, what is the most imposing vessel? Tim, you know, we saw what could have been a pig floating down here, but of course a pig or a dead pig is no stranger to this river, is it? No, no. If we'd have been here a couple of months back, we would have seen a flotilla, or an armada if you want, of at least 16,000 dead pigs floating down the river. Nice. That the city draws its water from. It's shockingly polluted, yeah. But it is symptomatic of the, the way these rivers have been used as a, a sewage system for mm. probably since there was first humans in the area. Look at this city, it's the size of Australia. That's a lot of bums to join to the river, isn't it? And while it was only a few people, it worked fine. Yeah. Trouble is when you've got 1.3 billion, the system just gets overwhelmed. One fifth of humanity lives in China, yet it has just 6% of the planet's fresh water. And one fifth of the drinking water in China's urban areas is contaminated. You see the number of dead fish just, yeah. just floating by. This river has lost a third of its fish species, we think. And among those, where there's the, the, the paddlefish, Chinese paddlefish, and this was a freshwater fish that was seven metres long. Wow. That dates back way before the age of the dinosaurs, okay. and that was only found in this river. 400 million years of evolution gone like that. That's it. Right. And, and it's not the only one, the beiji, the, the white flag dolphin, gone yes. forever. Well, my feeling is, Tim, people couldn't give a bugger. People are more interested in, oh, I don't know, getting a new car, a new apartment, a new handbag, buying a drink, meeting someone. They couldn't give a bugger about this. Not one. Not one single B in bugger. But the wealthy Shanghainese don't need to give a bugger. If Chinese rivers are contaminated, they can afford to fish elsewhere. Here at China's biggest seafood market, you can find anything you fancy from anywhere across the globe. Australian lobsters, That's certainly. Okay. American lobsters, Alaskan king crab, there's stuff from all over the world here. Amazing. What are these, Tim? These? They look attractive, don't they? They're gooey ducks. Gooey there ducks. What do you do from, with them? Well, it doesn't look like it, but you eat them. They're probably from uh, Canada, Pacific Coast, somewhere like that. Oh, Seattle. Looks like it belongs in the menu of the uh, penis restaurant. It does a bit. Actually, it'd probably do that restaurant prep. China has the potential to become a $20 billion seafood import market by 2020. But it will push up global prices for premium seafood products like ours. Great for our fishers, perhaps, but not for our consumers. Where the average wage is what it is, it's, uh, there's some impressive prices being paid here for seafood. Some species are at risk of being eaten to extinction. What sort is it, Jim? It's one of the snapping turtle type things. An ancient animal. Yeah. From yeah, Yunnan yeah. province. Turtles, Turtles are coming from all over the world now into China to meet yeah. the demand for okay. them because they're such a prestigious food. So, how much does she expect to get for it? Yes, it's a matter. Is it being sold for food to eat? Yeah. I feel 
sorry for it. You can buy it and set it free. But where? Well, exactly. Not many unpolluted mountain streams around here. It's a grim reminder of how ravenous China's appetite is. Not a good time to be a turtle. You can imagine at those prices what the demand is, what the pressure is on the wild turtle stock. I'd like to know how many hands it's gone through from the wild river to here. Yeah, oh yeah, well, probably quite a few. But they're not just coming from China now, they're coming from as far afield as Madagascar, Africa, yeah. even the United States. Can we see this one here, big one? This one, again, probably somewhere in Southeast Asia. But oh. what's, what's happening, and Chinese have eaten most of their own turtles because they're a favourite food. Yes. And then now there's a trade, international trade, that's driving a lot of species to extinction. Yes. So this is a soft-shell turtle. See? Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you see that these yeah. are... Oh, we don't want to be careful. Oh. They're serious biters, John, so right. be careful. All right. Oh, I think we've seen enough. Oh, good. Oh, there you go. <laughs> There he goes. In. <laughs> I've had enough of turtles. I'd like to buy an Australian rock lobster video. Yes. Odalia. Uh, ah, beautiful. beautiful. Very good. Yeah. How much, Tim? I know, 350, but. Cheap. Get cheap. It. Good. That's about 70 bucks. Is that what we paid, huh? 350. Oh, round about. Something like that. It's close. We can probably get a discount. We persisted. Ah, he's got to make a living. All right. All right then. Done. Yeah, yeah. Good. Deal. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Good. What's the way to you? Whoop that the bar. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Well, you drive a hard bargain. Well, I was, I, I, I'm best when I'm not trying, John. It's yeah. like a lot of things in life. I just, you know. Yeah. One. One. Two. Hang on. How much was it? How much? More. Three hundred. Four. Five. 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 Six. Six. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five. Oh, they're all getting six. That's. Two hundred dollars. Turn your head in. Two hundred? No, no, it's not, is it? Two hundred bucks. Oh yeah. Two hundred no. bucks. No, Less. no. Four bucks. No, I'm blowed if I know, John. I. Four hundred ninety-six bucks. No. <laughs> Actually, it was a hundred bucks, but we're still feeling well and truly ripped off. So we take our expensive Aussie lobster and ask the chef to cook it for us in the finest house style. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Well, all right, we've got a live lobster here, Tim. Yeah. I don't think I can eat this, Tim. No, a live lobster with its guts ripped out and minced up. Yeah, yeah. I, I muscle ripped out and minced up. Yeah. I can't eat that. No, no, neither can I. Well, something's obviously been lost in translation because we asked for a cooked lobster. Instead, we get a live lobster brought out. Yeah. And it tells me something about the relationship here between people and animals. Um, I find that really troubling. Yeah, me too. So all I suggest we do is pay the cook, say thank you very much, and discreetly make our way out. It's our last night in Shanghai, a city of staggering extremes. Tim and I retreat to a bar to try to make sense of it all. Shanghai really is a city out of control. Mm. You know, it's yep. everything that the people in Beijing fear that it is. Yes. Uh, it's capitalism run rampant. Yes. But it's also incredibly vibrant. <laughs> Yeah. And you can see the attraction of it. We have seen many extraordinary things. We've seen extreme po poverty. We've, we've seen workers, migrant workers, being paid very, very little, who are proud of what they're achieving. Yeah, yeah, we've seen multi-millionaires proud of what they're achieving yeah, here. Yeah. And I wonder what it is they are achieving here. The cost of making everyone a little bit better off every year on the cheap is a Wangpu River full of dead fish. Mm. It's a city without a sewerage system that functions properly. Right. The day I reckon he has to come in some ways, either people will deal with these problems yes. or it will overwhelm them. Yes, that's true. But I wonder, Tim, about what it's telling us about China. And I wonder if 5,000 years of accumulated civilization means anything here. They're reaching forward, reaching for what they perceive the West has got, and they want that in as much a volume as they can get. 
They mm. want the West. They want to even be more West than the West, if that is possible. But that's the way I see it. Mm. And honestly, Tim, if the planet has a future, the change has got to happen here. Oh, yeah. If anyone can achieve massive change quickly, China can. Yes, it's true. It could be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe there's that. Maybe that's the upside, that China has the ability to change its soul yeah, yeah. if it wants to. Let's toast to China. Well, let's Shanghai. toast to China. Now, this wine, Tim, it's interesting. This is um, the most popular Australian wine in China. It's Grange Hermitage. Yes. I've never tried it before. No? Well, it's, I've had it once this is before. 2008, a, a beautiful year, they yeah, tell me. The best. And I have had a sip, and I haven't really been able to focus on it too much. But mm. when in Rome, Tim, Oh, John. I don't know what the uh, ratio is here. Mm. I'm just guessing. But this is the way it's drunk here. Have I got to join you with this? Yeah. Oh, God. All right. Sacrilege, John, sacrilege. My gee, Tim, you know, I hate to say it. <laughs> but I think it's an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Where next? Hey. West. West. New West. beauty. Westwood Ho, where we'll okay. see hopefully a bit more of the real China. All right. Next time, it's the Wild West. You know, Chengdu got the prettiest women yes. in China, and over three to four thousand pups. Yes. Australia Chinese relationships. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 90 million people on the rise. Sort of paralysed by choice. We can either go to mall there, mall there. China just fancy the idea of number one. The world's biggest building, Tim. Well, world's fattest building, John. Yeah. Opportunities galore for Australia. Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Wine. Wine, yes. Wild boar, that's your answer. That's all we got. Pigs. Well, what's this about, Tim? Bloody Melbourne Cup happening on my head. And hope for China's future. I must say, I feel really privileged to yeah. be able to come up here and see natural China, because it's extraordinarily beautiful. <laughs>